Um, so thanks for having me tonight. And I'm gonna be going over a couple different things in this presentation, uh, but primarily what fossils might you find, especially if you're participating in the site stewardship program across Southern Nevada. Um, so like Rayette said, uh, I am a paleontologist. Uh, I also am the park guide for Tule Springs Fossil Beds National Monument. So um, we are a small park, a new park. So uh, although my position might have different duties day to day that my background is in paleontology. So um, I work both with a uh, paleontology stewardship program at Tule Springs as well as outreach um, and other things like that. So a lot going on, but I started working for Tule Springs in 2020 uh, through the scientist and parks program. And now I have a permanent position with them. Um, and to give you some context as to where Tule Springs is at, I'm going to, uh, no, there it is. The laser pointer here. Uh, no. Sorry about that. Uh, Tule Springs is a pretty large park. It's about 26,000 acres, and it borders the cities of North Las Vegas and Las Vegas, as well as the Desert National Wildlife Refuge uh, to the east. And then to the west is actually Red Rock Canyon National Conservation Area. Uh, we also border on um, the Las Vegas Paiute Snow Mountain Reservation, and then also um, lots of parcels of Bureau of Land Management land, state park land, and city land. Um, so there's a lot of neighbors that we have, um, and I'm going to be going into that actually later on in the presentation to talk about some different rules that different agencies might have um, regarding fossils. So we're pretty much going to be taking a journey through the fossil record at a very surficial level. So we're not going to be going into exact species of things necessarily, but just how to recognize things that you might find when you're out in the desert. Because really recognizing something in that initial time is a lot more important than having a very specific identification right off the bat. Because as long as you're able to be descriptive and document things uh, in a detailed way, you could always relay that to an expert who can make an official um, identification of what you might have found at your site. So first, we're going to do a brief overview of geologic time, the fossil record, and also the field of paleontology. And then we're going to go through like a time machine journey from past to present through the fossil record of Southern Nevada and what might be more common in some of the sites that you are visiting. Uh, we're also going to go over how to properly document those fossils in your field notes or reports, um, and then also the different rules and regulations about fossil collection on different public lands. So geologic time is kind of an interesting thing where um, I know that the way that time is described within archaeology and anthropology uh, focuses on historic versus prehistoric uh, so the geologic time scale is broken down more like a calendar is broken down, where when you have a calendar, you have years, you have months, weeks, days, hours. So you have larger chunks of time and then smaller chunks of time within that. And the geologic time scale has that, but it has a slight difference in that when we try and break down so much time, you know, 4.5 billion years of time, that the way that we break that down is not into even pieces. So like you would say, oh, you know exactly how long one day is. Like yesterday is just as long as today. Um, and that one year is 365 and a quarter days long. But when you look at geologic time, it's not based on standardized increments. It's actually broken down from events. So it's going to say the difference between uh, the Jurassic period and the Cretaceous period, for example, can be an event that was seen worldwide instead of, oh, it's been exactly 100 million years, time for a new period. Um, so that's really the biggest difference between large scale time and how it's categorized and small scale time. So what kinds of events uh, would that be? So the biggest one uh, that the geologic time scale is based off of are things like mass extinctions uh, and sometimes as they relate to large global climate events, such as maybe a large scale glaciation or maybe a large scale warming event or um, ocean geochemistry changes. And, and often these things are related because animals and plants uh, and other living things tend to have a really specific relationship with their environment and life changes as the environment changes. And the good news is that both of these things are reflected in the rock and fossil records. So it's kind of like 
a chicken egg situation. You're making a scale based on these events that are captured in the rock record. Um, so, you know, it's, you have these large scale um, events where it can change the types of rocks that you find. Uh, it also um, can change what types of fossils that you find. So in, in one layer, you'd find dinosaurs. And then in the next layer after it, there aren't any more left. Um, and that would be how you would know that that kind of extinction took place. Um, and this time scale was developed long before more precise modern dating methods were available. So um, some dating methods were developed fairly recently, um, as you know, like 60 years ago or something like that. Um, but this time scale is updated annually. There's a committee that meets to update these tiny, minute changes in these dates. Um, but instead of going into all of these really, really tiny little um, designations of time, we're going to be more focusing on these larger um, Paleozoic, Mesozoic, and Cenozoic eras um, in terms of what types of fossils that you might find. So the fossil record in paleontology uh, can be broken down with the geologic time scale and partially just because life has changed significantly over time. There are certain plant and animal groups that were dominant in these three distinct uh, eras of geologic time. And the record of life is represented by fossils. There are probably lots of living things that did not get preserved as fossils that we'll never know about. But what did get preserved is how we know what things used to live on Earth, what things have changed over time. Maybe some things have stayed very similar. Um, but it, it helps us have this sort of snapshot into the past of what types of life uh, were dominant in these ecosystems all across the world. And paleontology is the study of the fossil record of ancient life. Uh, there's many ways to be a paleontologist um, in the way that both what questions you're asking or maybe what research methods you use to answer those questions. Um, so sometimes people focus more on the biology side of things, like maybe what animals' relationship with their ecosystem was. Uh, other times people have a more ge geology-centered types of questions, like how are these fossils preserved? So a colleague of mine studies a field of how these fossils can be preserved in environments, and are certain environments better at preserving those fossils? And then also sometimes people look at questions through a long period of time and how do certain things affect life over a long time period or even a short time period. Um, so paleontologists can work uh, for public lands like I do. Uh, they can work in compliance and mitigation work, especially around Las Vegas. There's a lot of development that requires paleontological monitoring. Um, and then also sometimes people work at museums, at universities, sometimes they're educators uh, in both K through 12 and higher education. Um, so there's lots of places that paleontologists can work um, and lots of types of things that they can do day to day. And there's kind of two main types of field work that you'd be doing as a paleontologist in the field uh, regarding fossil specimens. Uh, so you can either have these um, specimens in situ or in place and preserving them in place, or you can excavate and curate fossils where you'd be actually digging and removing them from the ground. So excavation and curation is probably the most common image of paleontology that people have in their mind off the top of their head. They think of digs or excavations where paleontologists would actually dig down into the ground and recover fossils. Now, any time that you remove a fossil from public lands, especially federal public lands, you are basically um, making a, an agreement that you're going to care for these fossils in perpetuity and that those fossils are going to reside at a uh, repository, whether that's um, managed by the public land management agency or by a different external repository that's acting on their behalf. Um, so part of the uh, issue with excavation is that you have to have space for those fossils. You have to have the staff to curate those in perpetuity. Um, but it's also time consuming um, where you'd have to have several days that you can spend in the field um, doing this kind of work. It is time consuming. And like I said, anytime you excavate fossils, you have to uh, add them to a museum collection, which can be difficult um, if places have limited staff or room for these fossils. 
So when you preserve things in situ, uh, this is very similar to the cultural site steward program where you'd be visiting the same fossil site many times, sometimes annually, sometimes quarterly, sometimes only every like five to 10 years. And you would be documenting uh, any changes uh, in this particular fossil from year to year. Um, and part of the purpose of doing that is to um, avoid those problems, like I said before, with uh, collection, uh, if you don't have the staff time to excavate these things, or if they just can't be removed easily. And fossils come in many forms. Uh, as a site steward, the most likely fossils you're probably going to see are things like Paleozoic marine invertebrates, Mesozoic trace fossils, Cenozoic mammal fossils, but we're going to go into what all of these things mean. So it's time machine time. We're going to go through geologic time to share some of the fossils that you might encounter when you're out on public lands as a site steward. Um, so we're going to be in the Paleozoic era right now, uh, which is from about 542 to 252 million years ago. This is a huge chunk of time here. Um, I'm not going to be breaking it down into geologic periods, uh, again, more so just because as long as you know some identifiable information and generally in the time scale where you're at, then that can definitely help narrow it down once you get home. So during the Paleozoic, um, Earth looked a lot different than it did today. So a lot of people have heard of Pangaea before. This was the time that Pangaea was really all nestled together, was toward the end of this um, uh, Paleozoic time. So I put a red arrow where Nevada is on this map. Uh, so at the time, uh, this was a marine environment. So it wasn't the same like how it is today. North America was really smushed up against all the other continents. Um, so you had these large oceans uh, external to the continents. You had this kind of interior seaway and then also smaller seaways within North America. So a very different time than we're used to today. And this is the time that a lot of people say, oh, Nevada used to be underwater. And so some examples of these Paleozoic rocks that are very present in uh, Southern Nevada, especially the Las Vegas Valley, uh, and even going into Pahrump, are things like the Spring Mountains. We have Frenchman Mountain, and then also uh, the Las Vegas and Sheep Ranges are also um, Paleozoic limestone. And so limestone is formed in a marine environment. So remember, Nevada is in a marine environment at this time. So the sedimentary rocks that are going to be formed are the types that form in marine environments. So often you get things like shale and limestone. Um, and these are things that are formed at the bottom of seas and usually by uh, living things. So you get things like plankton uh, and all the mud that would fall to the bottom. So some of the fossils that you might encounter in these types of Paleozoic rocks uh, are marine organisms. So things like sponges. Uh, and sponges are animals. I know they kind of look like plants or just something strange when you look at them, but they are in fact animals. Uh, they're not super complex like a, um, a mammal would be. They don't have a brain or anything like that. Uh, they're just kind of this weird little colony of cells uh, that's shaped kind of like a tube or a blob. Um, but they're very cool creatures and they've been around a really long time. Uh, these are some uh, photographs of some sponges in the field. So sometimes what you'll encounter will be a round shape with a hollow center. And that hollow center is from sponges actually sucking in water into the uh, sides of the sponge and then they come up through the tube and it's a way for them to filter feed. So it goes through the middle of the sponge out the top like a chimney. So whenever you see the holes in those sponges like that, that's where the water would shoot out um, for it to filter feed. Other times you see details of the sponge and it looks just like a sponge, the texture of it. Um, other times you see kind of a weird more like blob shapes, uh, which you'd see in living sponges. So sponges are still alive today, not necessarily in Southern Nevada because we're not underwater anymore, uh, but you see the remnants there. So another thing that you might see are called crinoids. If you're British, you'd probably say crinoid. Um, and they're related to things like sea stars and urchins. So they're not closely related to corals. Um, they're actually more closely related to us than they are to corals. Um, but basically, uh, crinoids are um, an animal made up of, there's a, a hold fast at the bottom for them to anchor themselves to the ocean floor. They have a stem or a column made up of these tiny little, um, they almost look like Cheerios or like if you have a candy necklace. So it's these uh, round um, little Cheerio looking things that get stacked on top of each other to make that column. There is a, a, 
a top part of this crinoid that almost looks like feathers or arms that would wave around and filter feed for this animal, but you tend to not find that part of it. It's a lot more common to find the stems, partially because that's just what makes up most of the body is the stem. Uh, so sometimes you'll see them uh, disarticulated as those individual little pieces, or sometimes you find the stems uh, articulated together. Looks kind of like a stack of pennies. You will also sometimes find things like corals. And corals, uh, the types that you find in the fossil record aren't the same kinds that live today, but they share some features uh, with, with uh, the corals that are still alive. So uh, one of the things that corals have that something like a sponge wouldn't have are things called septa, which are basically um, these lines that go into the center of the coral where it looks like it radiates out kind of like a little sun. So um, sometimes you might find something where if you're not sure, like maybe it's a sponge, maybe it's a coral, I don't know. The best thing you can do is to draw it, uh, and I'll go over that later again, and to just notice features that you see, like do you see these sort of um, marks that go toward the center? Do you see a lot of smaller pieces all together? That would mean you have this colonial coral, like you'd see in a coral reef, or do you see them by themselves and they'd be solitary? You also might find things like trilobites. So trilobites are related to things like spiders, horseshoe crabs, insects. Um, so they have a hard exoskeleton like any insect or spider, anything like that will. Um, so these are usually not found in limestone as much as they are found in things like shale. Um, and so trilobites, oftentimes you'll find just their head or maybe their, the bottom segment, uh, their bottom really, um, because just like things like crabs and insects, anything that would have a hard exoskeleton, they have to actually shed the exoskeleton to grow. So a trilobite can leave behind many of its heads throughout its lifetime as a fossil as it molts. So sometimes you just find a head, sometimes you find the whole body as you find a trilobite. They range in size from really tiny, they can be about the size of like a, a, a dime or a nickel. Sometimes they can be quite large, it all depends. Um, and so trilobites are a really cool fossil to find. Um, I think a lot of people just think that they're super cool because uh, it's just kind of neat to think about this little tiny little bug that used to live on the bottom of the ocean. Brachiopods are a tough one. I have some on my desk, actually. I have a brachiopod here. This is from New York. It's not from Nevada. So brachiopods kind of look like clams or some other kind of bivalve, like a scallop, but they're different. So they're just superficially similar to a mollusk, but they're distantly related to mollusks. Uh, there are still brachiopods on Earth. They're just not as common as they used to be. Uh, the main way to tell the difference between a bivalve and a brachiopod, which we'll go over on a slide in a couple seconds, um, is that when you look at the shells of a brachiopod and you look at the plane of symmetry, that the plane of symmetry here is perpendicular to the hinge, halfway like this. So the plane of symmetry is not along the hinge of the brachiopod, it's perpendicular to it up and down this way. So it'd be symmetrical in the way that like, um, not the way that a book would be, but opposite to that. Um, so mollusks, on the other hand, the line of sym symmetry is parallel to the hinge, uh, meaning that it would open like a book and be symmetrical like a book. Um, also, you can have snails uh, as part of mollusks. Snails are pretty common. Uh, I see them a lot in limestone around Las Vegas. Uh, and snails can take many shapes, but they're often shapes that you'd see in modern sea snails or terrestrial snails, things that have a spiral shaped shell or more kind of like a spire shape. Um, so again, like a, a good way to identify something is to make a drawing and maybe consult somebody when you get back home uh, to get a more positive identification. So like I said, when you think about brachiopods versus bivalves, they're very similar in that they both have this hard shell. Um, it's made out of the same material. They're just both animals that happen to make a similar product, but uh, they are a little bit different. And like I said, that instead of the line of symmetry being along the hinge, that the line of symmetry in a brachiopod is perpendicular to that hinge. So sometimes in the uh, Paleozoic, you also find things like trace fossils. So toward the end of, really actually toward the middle of the uh, Paleozoic era, you had uh, life starting to uh, take over land. And by, and, and I mean really animals in that case, uh, plants started to colonize land pretty early on in the Paleozoic. 
um, but you started to get things like tetrapods or uh, things like amphibians, uh, early reptiles, and um, these things walking around on the ground surface. So sometimes you get these trace fossils like ones found at Lake Mead or Gold Butte where you have these really interesting um, footprints left over um, from animals walking on the ground surface. So going into the Mesozoic, so now we're getting closer to the present. This is about 252 to 65 million years ago. Um, and this is a time period that a lot of people are very familiar with, more so because I think lots of people at some point in their life, not just when you're kids, but a lot of people take an interest in learning about dinosaurs because they are such interesting creatures. Uh, they were so large. It's, it's really something that captivates a lot of people's imaginations and interest in science. Um, so this is a time period that I think people are also very superficially similar, um, familiar with. Um, and it doesn't just include the Jurassic, you know, this goes all the way from the Triassic up to the Cretaceous. Um, so looking at another map of the Earth during this time, Pangaea has now broken apart. You start to form the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans, um, although the continents are much closer together. You have large mountain building events occurring all over the globe. If you notice, one of my favorite parts of the Mesozoic, which I think is really, really cool, doesn't affect Nevada, but I still think it's cool, that uh, India at the time was not attached to Asia. It actually was attached to Madagascar, and later on, India would actually um, move up toward Asia, collide with it to create the Himalayas. So when you think of the highest mountain range in the world, that's largely thanks to um, India slamming into the rest of Asia to create that mountain range. So uh, Mesozoic in Southern Nevada, some of the most remarkable exposures of it include, um, this, this formation has two names depending on what state you're in. It's either the Navajo or the Aztec sandstone. Um, and this sandstone is uh, not only beautiful to look at, but people love to go rock climbing uh, in these exposures. They love to go hiking. It's a really beautiful place to be, uh, depending on what you're super interested in in the outdoors. Um, and these outcrops are sandstone, so we're not in a marine environment anymore. When you look at this map, we're on the edge of this ocean, but we're not underwater anymore. When you think about um, ichthyosaurs in Nevada, that's our state fossil, they were found uh, further north where it was this interior seaway in southern Nevada. We were not underwater during this time. We were a terrestrial. Uh, and these environments are represented by these large sand dunes. They're called ergs. Uh, ergs today can be found in places like the Sahara, where you had these very extensive fields of sand dunes that were um, environments for things like dinosaurs, for proto mammals uh, and other reptiles and insects, things to live in, um, where you had some water and enough water to preserve things like footprints uh, and enough water to uh, sustain life in these environments. Uh, later on in the Mesozoic, you had more environments like wooded areas with rivers that was more so in the Cretaceous period, uh, transitioning out of that dune ecosystem more into like forests and things like that, also with dinosaurs. So you often find trace fossils from this time. Um, a lot of times it's preserved dinosaur footprints, which is really cool. So you get this tridactyl footprint that's similar to what you'd see from like an ostrich or another very large bird. Uh, and so these footprints are often found in that Aztec sandstone in both Red Rock and Valley of Fire. Um, sometimes you also get small proto-mammal footprints um, that almost look like, if, if you have a cat, I have a cat, I love her very much, but I'll, I'll come home and I'll find her tiny little paw prints all over the kitchen table. And so it kind of looks like tiny cat paw prints uh, of these animals that were ancestors to uh, living mammals today. You can also find arthropod traces, so things from like, like a scorpion-like creature, um, but those are very difficult to identify. Um, sometimes they can look very similar to like raindrop impressions in the rock, uh, so it's okay. But these uh, three-toed footprints are really interesting to find because some of them are quite close to cultural sites. You also might find things like petrified wood. This is a picture from Lake Mead. There is also petrified wood found in Valley of Fire State Park. Um, petrified wood can range anything from like a giant log to even just small pieces. Um, but petrified wood is really interesting where it basically is the wood from a tree where all of the organic material is no longer present, but it got replaced by something like quartz where it's much harder and resistant to weathering. So while like organic wood would have rotted away over a hundred million years, 
uh, that the uh, silica that replaced the wood is still there and still intact. You might find body fossils uh, from the Cretaceous. It's a lot less likely. So um, I've been in Valley of Fire State Park looking for these things uh, on in research I did uh, with a, a previous job. Um, so we found things like pieces of turtle shell, um, which is on the left. In the middle, you have uh, bones from dinosaurs. And then on the right, sometimes you can find um, scoots or like skin bones from things like crocodiles. But you're not as likely to see these types of fossils because the exposures of Cretaceous rocks in Southern Nevada is really, really um, minimal. And it's also just kind of difficult to get to. I don't think there are many cultural sites identified in the area that these rocks are exposed. So moving on now to the Cenozoic, which is our current era. Um, that is where we currently are all the way at the top in the Holocene. Uh, but this is going to start from about 65 million years ago to today. So many people know it's a very famous mass extinction between the Cretaceous uh, and the Paleocene. Um, this is the one that everybody knows with the meteor. So this is a big extinction that delineates the Mesozoic from the Cenozoic period. But actually, the extinction that happened from the Paleozoic to the Mesozoic was much larger. Um, so we're in the Cenozoic now. We're in a terrestrial environment still. But I want to note that in southern Nevada, it was not icy. So in some areas of um, North America and then also Europe and Asia, during this time, you had large scale glaciations. We didn't have that ice down here uh, in southern Nevada. It was a different climate. It was cooler. But we just didn't have like these large sheets of ice necessarily uh, that you'd have up in like Canada, for example. And the Cenozoic is a really interesting time because you did get this really intense warming uh, about halfway through during this Miocene time where it was much hotter than it is today. So you go from this like really, really, really hot time period to a cooler time period. So there was a lot of environmental change during this time. So you can find things like trace fossils, uh, which can include things like bird footprints. Now, it might be hard to tell the difference between a bird footprint and a dinosaur footprint, but again, being really detailed in your description of where you are and just what the footprint looks like might help you make that determination. Um, so that's a bird footprint on the left from Lake Mead. Uh, the upper right are camel footprints. If you look closely, these footprints have two toes, a little hoof from camels. Camels were very, very common in Southern Nevada uh, throughout the Cenozoic, all the way up to the end of the Pleistocene, uh, which was our last ice age. So camels were a very, very common sight across Southern Nevada, and they make up a lot of the uh, footprints that you might find um, near Lake Mead and, and near uh, the Colorado River, et cetera. You also might find um, some other carnivore footprints. So things from, uh, they're kind of animals that predate when dogs and bears officially split off from each other. Uh, so you might get things that look like paw prints. Um, and it's also worth noting that if you are trying to tell if it's a fossil footprint versus maybe something, an animal that was walking about in a wash, that these footprints are all, the rock is solid around it. They're not soft. Um, so you will find footprints from things like people's dogs or you know lizards or like little rodents scampering around, but that's in loose sediment. The fossil footprints are in solid rock. Um, it's not loose. So Pleistocene fossils are what you primarily find in the Tule Springs area and also similar sediments um, that extend past the park's boundaries. Um, so these are things like saber-toothed cats, bison, dire wolves, um, Pleistocene horses, American lions, camels again, and mammoths. Um, so these are some of the large now extinct creatures that were here. And these bones are going to look similar to, um, you know, you might recognize some of the shapes from animals that we have today, like horses are still around, just a different kind. Um, you know, bison are still around, just a different kind. Um, but it's important to note that these Pleistocene fossils are not petrified, they're not turned to stone. So although they are fossils, they're over 10,000 years old, that the bone itself hasn't been turned to stone. So um, in a lot of cases, Pleistocene fossils aren't going to feel more dense or heavy, like a, a bone that may have been replaced with another mineral or like heavy, like petrified wood is. Um, it's very similar to the texture of modern bone. So these are uh, some of those animals just reconstructed. We have our wolves, bison, uh, horses, lions, giant ground slots, saber-toothed cats, camels, and mammoths. 
but there also were a lot of animals represented in the Tule Springs fossil record um, that are still alive today. So we'll find bones from things like coyotes, mountain lions, badgers, kangaroo rats, um, horned lizards, antelope ground squirrels, bobcats, birds, things like hawks, ducks, owls, desert tortoise. We got all these little rodents like pocket gophers and pack rats, as well as jackrabbits. So um, some of these fossils are indeed found of animals that survived last ice age. And the, the key to knowing the difference between these is if you do see bones at your site and you're not sure if it's fossil or not, you can take a picture to see. Um, oftentimes the uh, fossils that you would, or fossils that you find don't have that kind of dry splintered texture uh, that bones do when you find like a um, bighorn sheep skull, for example. So the, the texture of these bones um, is, like I said, similar to modern bone, but you don't have this like white kind of stripped dry appearance that a lot of the bones um, are still in their more or less original color where they're kind of this off-white color. Um, so sometimes when you find bones they're not in very good shape. Uh, erosion is definitely at play um, in the sediments of Tule Springs. This is a long bone sticking out of the ground. Uh, so is this. And then you also sometimes find um, snail shells from uh, spring deposits there at Tule Springs. So how do I document fossils at cultural sites? This is something that uh, you probably would like to know. So I'm going to give an example that let's say I am doing uh, that my site is Adelaide Rock uh, at Valley of Fire State Park. And I walk up the stairs to Adelaide Rock to uh, start to document uh, my site here. But then you look up on top of the rock art and you notice in the overhanging ledge, there's a feature there that looks like it sticks out to you. And when you look closer at that feature, you realize that, oh, these are actually dinosaur footprints that are preserved in the overhanging ledge above the rock art at Adelaide Rock. So what would I do in this case? So the first thing is you would make sure that you would not collect these types of footprints, especially if they were loose. Uh, you would not try and remove it from the surrounding rock or sediment. I know in this case, gravity plays a good role in preventing that, but let's say it were on the ground, you wouldn't want to remove it from the surrounding rock. Part of the reason for that is because you don't want it to break. Um, these types of rocks might split and you don't want to actually uh, make it worse. <laughs> Uh, you also don't want to bury it. If you find it within the ground, you don't want to rebury it to hide it from somebody because then if a paleontologist visits the site to document it, we can't find it again. And this has happened to me a few times where somebody found a fossil site and then sent it to me and I was unable to relocate it because they didn't tell me that they buried it and then I couldn't find it. What you do want to do is document the occurrence, especially if it's an unknown occurrence. And sometimes you may not know, you could still document it anyway, but it's really important to know because if, if we don't know about it, then there's no way of following up. Uh, you'd also want to alert your supervisor within your program. Uh, and potentially, if, if they don't relay it to the agency, uh, you'll just have to communicate with your supervisor who's going to relay that to the agency that uh, manages the site that you are um, visiting. So like state parks or um, you know whatever federal agency it would be, especially if it's a new site. So in your notes or on your form, whatever documentation you'd be filling out, you would wanna see if you can tell if this is a trace fossil or a body fossil. Am I looking at like a footprint or impression or am I looking at a piece of their body like uh, a piece of mammoth tusk or a piece of bone? So in this case, since these are the dinosaur footprints, we would be looking at a trace fossil. Uh, so then you would say, can I tell what kind? So if I can't tell what kind, I'd say, okay, so these fossils, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven of these footprints. Each of the footprints has three toes and it's uh, pointed at the bottom. And then it has these three pointy toes at the top. So if I couldn't tell what kind, I would wanna be very uh, descriptive to say what it was. And then that way someone could make a judgment later. So I personally know that these are growlator. So this is from a dinosaur uh, that has three toes but you don't have to know exactly what it is. So how large is it and what area does it cover? So you'd say, okay, so each footprint is approximately six centimeters uh, long and that the total area of the footprints covers about maybe three square meters or something like that. You'd wanna say the total area that that fossil covers. Um, so someone's aware when they try to relocate it or when you relocate it the next year. 
Um, you'd also want to say where is it in relation to the cultural feature or overall location that you're surveying. So, um, you know, you'd want to say, okay, when you're facing the outcrop that has the rock art, it is above it and to the right. And so you'd want to give someone direction, so that especially if you're not revisiting it, that whoever um, would be looking at these documents could find it again. You'd want to give people similar directions that you'd give if you were trying to tell someone where something was like a trailhead or parking lot. Um, you can also draw the fossils um, in your site sketch to say, okay, if I'm documenting where these isolated finds are on my map, I'm also going to document where these fossils are. Um, and then also to say the GPS location of that uh, fossil, if it's different from the GPS point of the, the datum, for example, of your um, site. You'd also want to take photographs. When you take photographs of fossils, it's really important to take a, both a close up and then also a zoomed out overview of where that is. It's also really helpful if you circle or mark or point to where those things are. And part of that is because as much as you would think, oh, I really wanna get as much detail as possible, sometimes if you don't take that overview photo, you can't find it again. You'd think, oh no, there's no way I'll miss it next time, but then a year passes and it's really, really hard to relocate or it just takes a really long time. Uh, so it's really nice to have things like, um, especially if there's landmarks within the horizon, like if there's a staircase or like datum stake or tree or, or like creosote bush, if there's something that you know that that's going to stay there for a long time, or like a power line, it's a lot easier to line up your photo and to really tell where you are in your space if there's some sort of landmark um, in the way, or even the, the line of the mountains behind you is, is helpful. Um, if it's possible, a scale is really good for identification um, and just in general for your photos, it's really good. Sometimes it's impossible if it's above you or really high up. We don't want people climbing and doing anything unsafe. Um, but a good scale bar to use is you can actually have a scale bar. You might have one with you uh, anyway for your documentation. You could also use something of a standard size like a pencil or a pen or a coin. Um, to use as a scale. Fingers don't make the best scales. I've done it before in a pinch, but everybody's hands are different sizes. So it's fingers are kind of okay scales, not the best. You also want to document if there's any potential disturbances. So do you see a fossil uh, and then potentially a hole dug next to it? Or um, you know, maybe it looks like somebody broke off a piece. Um, anything that might look like some sort of human caused disturbance would be important to note. Um, it's also important to note if there's any trampling, like if you have fossils that have um, OHV or bicycle tracks or footprints over them, uh, it would be good to know if it was like right in the path of that. Um, also, just any major erosion, especially if you're in an area that has a lot of flash flooding um, or just is on a kind of a steeper slope and is prone to erosion. Um, and also just any signs of prior excavations that you might notice if there's sort of a quarry style pit near where you're at. Um, sometimes you might find metal datum stakes like you might find at a cultural site. Um, also, sometimes you find blobs of dried plaster in the soil around you. you you'd notice it. It's these white blobs of plaster uh, and plaster you can easily scratch with your fingernail. It's pretty soft. Um, and just if it already says in your site form that it's cross-referenced with a fossil site. A lot of um, fossil sites or rather cultural sites that were documented um, in the 1970s or prior include fossils in the cultural site documentation. Um, so, it, But usually it's kind of vague. It'll just say fossils found and then it'll have like an X on the map and not be very specific. So here's the, the picture of me that was featured in the introduction. Um, and I just wanted to show what it looks like when you visit the same fossil twice, uh, that here I am on the left putting, uh, this is a special type of glue consolidant for fossils in the field, um, that the picture on the top right is when I visited this site, this is a, a Pleistocene animal, mammal vertebra, um, probably something like a bison, uh, maybe, or a horse. And then, so there's a, a vertebra right above that scale bar and the picture below it is, um, a year later. So even with chemical consolidants, you could see how much erosion took place um, for these fossils and why it's important that we know about these sites and are able to manage them together with the cultural sites. So some rules and regulations about fossils on public lands, it varies a lot. So um, this is actually an interesting time to be talking about this because even though the Paleontological Resources Preservation Act 
went through in 2009, the final ruling just took place like three weeks, two, three weeks ago. Um, so now it's the final ruling is passed. It's a very exciting thing, uh, especially the uh, Park Service Paleontology Program was really pumped about it. Um, and pretty much it affects a lot of the federal land management agencies, um, and it directs them to manage and protect paleontological resources on federal land, uh, especially using scientific principles and expertise. Um, so in regards to research and preservation. So um, it mandates administering paleontological resource research and collecting permits and curation of fossils when they are collected into um, museum collection repositories. There also are specific criminal and civil penalties that are part of this law um, that would prosecute someone for uh, taking fossils from public land where it's prohibited. So someone uh, looting fossils, for example, would be one of those um, criminal activities. And uh, a lot of this affects what's called casual collecting, and I'll get into that. So on any of these federal land management agencies, including the Bureau of Land Management, the US Forest Service, Fish and Wildlife Service, Bureau of Reclamation, and the Park Service, on any of these lands without a permit, you are not allowed to collect any vertebrate fossils of any kind. So this includes footprints of vertebrate animals. So things like footprints from dinosaurs or from mammals are vertebrate fossils. It also prevents excavation. So any casual collecting only includes collection from the surface of the ground. It does not include uh, actually digging into uh, below the ground surface. It also includes cave formations. They're not technically fossils, but cave formations are protected, um, especially things like stalagmites and stalactites um, or any other features you'd find within a cave. And any casual collecting that happens on public lands that do allow it, you are not allowed to trade or sell any of those fossils. So if you find, um, you know, if you're on Bureau of Land Management land and you collect a really cool geode, you cannot sell that geode to somebody else. So no. None of those activities. <laughs> so on Bureau of Land Management land, you are allowed to collect reasonable amounts uh, for non-commercial use of certain things. So you can collect things like rocks and minerals, but it's limited. This is what they mean by casual collecting. You can only collect 250 pounds a year of these rocks and minerals. Uh, I know that's like a very specific amount. Uh, and technically you're not supposed to collect more than 25 pounds at a time, which would probably be like a bucket of fossils at a time. And to be honest, I don't know anybody that would want to carry that much more back with them in their bag. It's very heavy. Um, you also are allowed to collect common invertebrate fossils, things like brachiopods, trilobites, a lot of the things we looked at, like corals. Those things are invertebrate fossils. They're animals without backbones, and you are allowed to collect them on BLM land uh, to a reasonable amount. Petrified wood is also included in things that you can collect from BLM land. Again, these up to 250 pounds per year. Um, and this all, like I said, includes just surface collection. You're not allowed to uh, excavate for these things. Um, you're supposed to minimally disturb the ground surface. On forest service land, it's very similar, but their cutoff is like 10 pounds at a time or one five gallon bucket at a time. Um, but it has very similar rules to Bureau of Land Management land. So remember that both of these prohibit vertebrate fossils from being collected in any capacity. Bureau of Reclamation land, this was just changed in that new ruling on the Paleontological Resources Preservation Act, where you cannot collect fossils except where they tell you you can. So unless there's a sign now saying, please collect fossils from this area, they're going to have these areas that are meant for fossil collection. Um, but again, it would only apply to things like petrified wood and invertebrate fossils. Uh, for the Park Service and Fish and Wildlife Service, you can look at fossils and rocks, you could photograph them, you can draw them, you could make an interpretive dance about them, but you cannot collect anything at all from either of these types of administered land without an approved permit. So that includes rocks, that includes soil, plants, seeds, anything, um, any fossils of any kind. And it's always best to double check. So when in doubt, if you're unsure, it's good to see whose land you're on uh, to figure that out. Because the last thing you want is to accidentally get yourself in trouble uh, and just to know like what types of uh, rules and regulations are found where you're at. So thank you for uh, attending this presentation. I wanted to leave a bunch of time for questions, uh, especially since this topic is 
a little tangential to cultural resources and things like that. So I wanted to give uh, everybody time to um, ask whatever questions they'd like to ask. Okay, so that was an amazing presentation, Lauren. Um, you know, while everybody's getting their thoughts together and, and formulating their questions, I want to say thank you so much um, while they're doing that. Um, there was a lot of content that I didn't know um, when it came to the laws and the rules. And I think oftentimes the volunteer site stewards that do encounter fossils when they're out at their cultural sites and um, you know, having this information will make those visits so much better. And then also, you know, we always talk about, you know, Nevada being on the bottom of the ocean. So those images of showing how Pangea was breaking apart really helped me because I'm visual understand that time frame. So mm -hmm. thank you for doing that. Um, our first uh, comment here is just awesome. Thanks for this presentation. You're welcome. If there aren't questions, that's okay. I realized too, I sent myself a photo that I meant to include in the presentation that was of a bighorn sheep skull to show what modern bone looks like uh, compared to fossils. And I can pull that up. Um, it would just be, I'd have to unshare my screen and share it again <laughs> to grab it out of my email, but I'm annoyed I forgot to put it in there. You're welcome. Yeah, I mean, like fossils are super overwhelming too. Like most of the time someone could understand like that what they're looking at is not a geologic feature. Like usually when you notice something, it's cause you're like, wow, that looks like too perfect to be not something alive. <laughs> oh, cool. Glad we have a neighbor for Tule Springs. Yeah, somebody said, this was great. I live a block away from the Fossil Beds National Monument and we love it there and love learning more about it. And I'm gonna do a shameless plug too. We're gonna to have our, um, uh, Pleistocene Palooza event, which is for National Fossil Day, uh, October 1st, which is a Saturday. We're going to be having that event at Tule Springs uh, Fossil Beds National Monument on Saturday, October 1st from about 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. That'll be posted on our social media pages and our park website. Uh, we're just finalizing the permit with the city to be able to advertise it. <laughs> That'll be all about, uh, you can learn a lot more about the ice age and then also just how the past helps us learn about the present and, and vice versa uh, at Tule Springs that day. It'll be a lot of fun. There'll be a camel there. Well, I think a lot of this is relevant to today because we are experiencing such um, yeah. change and mm -hmm. you know, there's a lot of fear and you know, how do we predict what's coming? Um, and I think that's just always uh, a good thing to relate that back to people and what they're experiencing. And we do have a question. Uh, does Tule Springs have a visitor center? So we don't have a visitor center um, at the uh, on, on Tule Springs land. So basically, I'm going to scroll like all the way back to pretty much the second or third slide. I'll just do this. You can see my chaotic desktop. So um, let me minimize this. So uh, Tule Springs itself does not have a visitor center. Part of the reason for this uh, is because we just started our general management plan process about maybe like three or four months ago. And until that process is complete, which will be another two years or so, we can't build any structures at the park. So um, the outcome of that management plan will help determine if facilities are built um, one of the things that we'd like to have in lieu of a visitor center is like a research center or something that would support that type of scientific work um, and then also uh, education. But there is going to be a visitor center uh, adjacent to Tule Springs at Ice Age Fossil State Park. There's a black dot uh, within this little rectangle here. I'll turn the laser pointer on here. Uh, so there will be a visitor center that interprets the same types of fossils that will open, I believe, next year. Um, but I know that their schedule is a little bit behind. Just they they ran into a lot of um, 
hangups in construction with COVID uh, for, you know, you know how that, everybody knows how that went. <laughs> um, and that will be kind of a complement to the experience at Tule Springs. So it won't, we won't have the exact same thing, but hopefully something that would complement it uh, and supplement, you know, just. I know they've been working hard on that. And oh yeah, it looks great. I've seen the, what they've done so far. It's amazing. So I'm excited. Yep, they got the building and then they have to get the exhibits. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I believe right now they're working on things like trails and picnic areas. So um, it's it's moving along. They're doing a great job. It's just hard with, uh, you know, supply chain and COVID and everything. It's been really difficult uh, for a lot of people, I know. So I know there's a, a big, um, big demand for it. So yeah, <laughs> doing the best they can at state parks. All right. Uh, any other questions? Now, um, I don't know um, if this is the venue to talk about this, but um, I know that there is a couple different ways people can volunteer mm -hmm. out there. Um, do you want to talk about those? Yeah. On the line? Yeah, so um, our, a lot of our volunteers help out in a lot of different ways. So we, we always treasure the volunteers that we have that help us with our park operations. We're a very small staff um, of only five permanent employees and three uh, partners. So they have contracts through other organizations that support the park service. Uh, so we have a staff of about eight people for our whole park, uh, which is not a lot of people. Um, and so it's always nice, especially people that are interested in things like natural or cultural resources. Um, sometimes we have data management projects that are really helpful to have an extra set of eyes and hands on, uh, such as archiving, or um, sometimes volunteers help us out with our photography data management. Um, sometimes too, we, we'd like to train people uh, to help us do compliance surveys in the field, like whenever we have something like a fence or a, a trail going in, uh, it's nice to have people to be able to help us look for um, cultural resources that would be on the ground and potentially in that area. Um, in the future, we're going to have a larger paleontology site steward program. Um, I'm beta testing that program this fall with a smaller group um, to make sure that we can sustain a larger program and to kind of work out some of the kinks in that. Uh, so that's something I'm looking forward to in the future to have a very similar program to the site stewardship program, but specific to Tule Springs, but fossil sites. Um, and so we're definitely always looking for people who are super interested in the resources in that way. Um, we also have a, uh, if any of you have dogs that you love to bring out in the outdoors, we have a bark ranger program. Um, we love to have people be uh, ambassadors and help us out with our bark ranger hikes, as well as like tabling for events. Um, and then we also have a volunteer mounted horse patrol, um, where we have people, uh, equestrians and their horses that help do trail monitoring. So we have a lot of different programs. Um, and then some people just like to volunteer for like an isolated cleanup event or for uh, education like tabling. So if any of those things sound appealing to you, um, there's an email uh, that I will type into the chat, which is tusk information at nps.gov. Uh, every national park has a four letter acronym. Ours is tusk. Uh, the reason why it's not Thule is there's already Thule Lake. Tusk would to be like a mammoth tusk. Uh, so that's our uh, general information email uh, if you're interested in uh, volunteering. Excellent. And um, I'm super excited that you're on board there, Lauren. I think uh, you did a really great job making this information digestible by the general public. And so I'm looking forward to your education and outreach. Um, that you're going to be doing and any kind of partnering that we can help you out with where we're interested and I'm sure everybody this evening really enjoyed this presentation so we're going to go ahead and wrap it up. And sure, okay, thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you very much. If um, anybody, any last minute comments, questions? All right, have a wonderful Friday night. Um, have a good weekend and reach out uh, to tusk underscore information at nps.gov if you have any um, desire to volunteer or find out more about what's going on. Thank you. Good night. All right. Thanks, Lauren. Bye.